It was always going to turn out like this. Bridget McKenzie's resignation late yesterday might have solved one problem for the government, but it's created another. It rules a line under the so-called sports rorts affair, provided, of course, other officers don't get caught up in Labor's continued digging. But once again, it highlights the fragility of the National Party's leadership and its brand. Political parties need a purpose and they need cohesion. And the Nats have lacked both over the past year or so. Traditionally, they've been the conservative ballast in the coalition. Careful about change, concerned to protect the battler, respectful of tradition and, of course, deeply imbued with the cares and concerns of regional Australia. For some time, though, it's been hard to know what the Nationals really stand for. And smart Nats know this. They also know there's more Liberals representing regional seats than they are national, so it's a brand under pressure. Take New South Wales. In that state, the National Party leader, John Barillaro, has a big personality and carved out some product differentiation between him and the Liberals by pushing for more dams and more baseload power. But despite being the Deputy Premier, the results are not yet. And some, of course, of his state colleagues, the Surrey Hills Nationals, I call them, well, they've been more interested in pushing inner-city social issues like late-term abortion and assisted suicide than the bread-and-butter issues of down-to-earth Australians. And that's why the Shooters and Fishers Party has taken some of the Nats' safest state seats. And what they haven't won, they've certainly put the local MP under real pressure. In Canberra, despite the best efforts of Michael McCormack, who's a decent bloke and works hard, he just hasn't cut through. And as a result, the party's brand has suffered. More often than not, during his time as leader, the Nationals have often seemed more like a faction of the Liberals than the party I remember under Fisher, Anderson, Vale and Truss. And often enough, a confused and warring faction of Libs at that. Then there's the Barnaby-Joyce problem. Barnaby is not only by far the best known and most recognised Nat, but he's also the biggest personality in their party room, who's had nothing much to do to keep him politically occupied since departing the Deputy Prime Minister's job. Now, I appreciate that Canberra is still a bit obsessed with the reasons for his departure, but as his recent election result shows, the National Party's base has well and truly moved on. Just as Malcolm Turnbull made a big mistake leaving Tony Abbott out of his cabinet, McCormack should have found a cabinet spot for Joyce because it's hard to be a team player if the team captain won't put you on the paddock. The most likely outcome overnight, now given the calls are all being made right now so anything could happen, the most likely outcome is that nothing will change except that McCormack will now inherit a more ambitious deputy with the current front-runner said to be David Littleproud, who's created more enemies and friends in the bush with his mishandling of water and drought. If Joyce doesn't get up, would the government be smart enough to put Barnaby back in the Cabinet, taking Mackenzie's spot? By far, that's the best move, but plenty of times politicians, well, they're just dumb. Still, for all the messiness of the past couple of months, it would be a mistake to conclude that the government is in deep trouble. There's no doubt the Prime Minister was initially too hands off with the fires, but it's been strong on the coronavirus and he leads a cohesive team with steady as she goes policies, despite these troubles with the Nats. And unlike recent Liberal leaders, I've got to make the point, there's no aspirant undermining Morrison or causing him trouble. So while the polls have turned and some commentators today are making a lot of this, commentators that know what they're talking about will remember that bad polls didn't stop Morrison winning the unwinnable election. And while Anthony Albanese has cleverly exploited the government's short-term difficulties, Labor's fundamental problems remain. They are torn between old working class instincts for more jobs and high wages and new green left mantras who want taxpayer billions spent on climate change and more and more 
identity politics. For all his political rat cunning, there's not the slightest sign that Albo can bridge this chasm. And looking at Labor closely over the past few weeks, there's every sense that they're now believing their own press, that in fact they think they're clawing back support when the reality is that the government has lost it. What's more is that while Labor says it's moved on from its election defeat, it's really just papered over the cracks. The same personality divisions are there, as are the failed policies, the big taxes, the massive government spending. All of it is there and none of it has been revisited in the light of last year's re rejection from voters. But because of the government's own goals, Labor will continue to get away with murder.